All right, everyone. Uh, a week or so in coming, um, but I wanted to make sure I had all my facts straight because this is such an important and often overlooked and under discussed in its realities issue. And that is abortion and reproductive health, which the Supreme Court has chosen to kind of shadow address in a way that potentially probably uh, disavows precedent from back in the 70s, disavows uh, protection that has kept a lot of women healthy and safe, and not just women, obviously. Um, but so today we're going to start a little bit of the medical realities, the human biology piece, um, stats about who's getting abortions, what happens, um, the, the basics that you don't really hear discussed too much. Um, because I do feel like a lot of conversations lack those realities, maybe in an attempt to, uh, on both sides, or even on a neutral side, to kind of um, be sensitive, maybe. But the fact is that this is an essential part of the conversation. And it, it elucidates why things aren't as macabre as certain narratives would have you believe, and why it's so necessary, and why the narrative has to work a certain way. So we're going to talk a little bit about the biology and medicine there. And I should say right up top that this is an issue that is so <laughs> close to my heart and brain and womb, um, really all of those. I, I am somebody who's had an abortion. Um, it was a positive experience for me. I don't feel even kind of sad about it. I didn't then. We'll get to that. I'll talk a little bit more about it, but I'm also obviously a woman who is a lawyer and a scholar of the Constitution, um, and I come from a family of physicians. So from every angle, this is something that hopefully my voice will be helpful to add to the conversation because um, I do feel like some of these insights have been lacking on a lot of fronts, the personal, the medical, the legal. So uh, let's dive in. We'll start with this, and um, obviously, again, not only women can bear children, not only women can get pregnant, um, but just to repeat the stat as it was written in the study, and I'm going to include some citations in a link separately, and I'm also going to include links to places to donate, lobby, um, you know, organize, things like that. So just because I'm referencing them and they're not immediately visible, uh, check back and they will be available. And tell that to your haters and haters of choice too, because I do have the proverbial receipts. Uh, so one in four women will have an induced abortion by the age of 45 in this country. So um, noting here that induced abortion is what refers to the surgical or pill-based abortion. Um, when a woman miscarries, it's known as spontaneous abortion. So right there you see the parallel to something that happens awfully commonly. And it's really, really hard to draw a line saying that one is evil and one is not. So that slippery slope, not long a slope, honestly, is also worth bearing in mind because it is very hard to demonize abortion without demonizing spontaneous abortion. And I think rightfully, our society is not comfortable doing that, is not comfortable blaming women for their miscarriages <laughs> um, and making that akin to manslaughter if abortion is murder. So um, also, it's a really scary step backwards that could be right behind this one uh, based on the logic that they're using now. So um, on that note, <laughs> Uh, so almost half of all embryos spontaneously fail to continue developing in the first few weeks after fertilization. So what happens in the early pregnancy process is that you got the sperm, you got the egg. The egg descends when a woman or person who can bear children ovulates, drops the egg down, it's hanging out, the sperm comes to it, now there are two cells, um, if all goes according to the biological plan. 
So now we have these two cells hanging out, fertilized. They hang out together for a while, and in a few weeks after that, they implant on the uterine wall and um, start developing as a cluster of cells there. But, so this, this half of embryo spontaneously failing happens in the first few weeks when the egg has been fertilized but not implanted yet. So almost half in that early period. Um, just like we'll talk about with abortions in this period, a lot of women don't know they're pregnant. Um, my mom is comfortable with me sharing this, that she had had a miscarriage before she even knew she was pregnant, and this is the kind of thing that uh, it, emotions can range obviously on the issue of miscarriage, and we'll also address why that is not an inconsistent reality to acknowledge, that, you know, wanted pregnancies and the attachment to future children therein are a very different thing than unwanted pregnancies, and, and that it's not inconsistent to recognize that somebody can miscarry and be very upset, somebody can have an abortion and feel nothing, and that that doesn't change the medical and legal realities there. Um, but we'll get there. Bottom line is that almost half of embryos that have been fertilized spontaneously fail in the first couple weeks. So that's huge. Um, even after implantation, 10 to 25% of the, the pregnancies now implanted on the uterine wall. And the range in percentage there, 10 to 25, depends on maternal health and age and factors like that. But still, we're talking a, a fair amount of pregnancies fail and result in miscarriage after implantation. So this makes miscarriage the most common type of pregnancy termination. I mean, let that sink in, that miscarriage is the most common type of pregnancy termination. And while I don't like conversations about abortion that focus on these kind of side issues that everybody can empathize with and, and dodge the issue, because I think it, it makes it more taboo, I do think that recognizing the volume that this piece of the conversation would take up numerically and the risk of demonizing one at the expense of the other is massive. Um, so we'll note that right up top, that miscarriage is the outcome of a huge percentage of embryos that have been fertilized and it is the most common type of pregnancy termination. Now, over 65% of induced abortions occur in the first eight weeks of pregnancy. So that's well over half, and that's also close to the range that rules like, that laws like the one in Texas uh, take off the table, because usually heartbeat is around, heart detection is around six weeks. So we're talking about over 65% taking place in the first eight weeks of pregnancy. 91.4% occur before 13 weeks. So that means over 90% of abortions take place in the first trimester. Now, not all of us know what that means. I don't even fully know what that developmental cutoff is, but a lot of the rhetoric that you hear about abortion and a lot of the imagery, whether it be verbal, like Donald Trump talking about ripping babies out of wombs, or the billboards that you see with like a two-year-old or a six-month-old smiling happily, that's not what we're talking about 90 plus percent of the time. Um, I mean, it's not even what we're talking about with, with uh, late-term abortion, so let's get to that. But uh, it's just such a misleading representation. The vast, vast majority of abortions take place before any significant development has taken place, uh, while the size is still very small, because usually people who electively want to end a pregnancy and know that they don't want to bear that child, it's not like a flippant decision that you make when you're going through the Taco Bell drive through and you see a loud toddler. That's usually not the kind of circumstance that leads to an abortion. It's, it's somebody who knows the moment they find out that they're pregnant that they don't want to be a parent and they don't want to bear a child. So, a lot of them are very early. 90 plus percent happen before you even reach the second trimester. Um, a sobering word or two about late-term procedures. So we'll just address them. They're really heart-wrenching when you hear the stories, and I'm going to recount a couple just to, to give you an example because I think we all know, again, 
that there's kind of like this shadowy, scary reality, but we don't fully know what happens, and thus it is kind of hard to justify sometimes when we're actually having the conversation or trying to justify it to ourselves. So late-term procedures, and it's better to call them that than partial birth, which isn't even medically correct, um, but these are not flippant or easy decisions. Um, it's not people changing their mind and ripping a baby out. They are very uncommon, obviously. They're less than 10% of all abortions happen even second trimester. Uh, they are heavily regulated because of the greater development. Um, and this is also, as a side note, like, medicine is doing a pretty okay job of keeping this in check. It does it with all sorts of procedures. All procedures are regulated by patients, the medical community, and their physicians, and other healthcare professionals. So, um, they got this. They know what they're doing. And they take an oath to, you know, put life above all else. So they, they do the balancing just fine, in any case. Uh, so, late-term abortions are uncommon. They're heavily regulated. And they are often, especially the further on you get in the pregnancy, they're often outlawed outside of emergent circumstances. So a uh, grave risk to the mother and or child um, should they be born. So a couple examples of this, and again, there will be sites to these in my little link page, but uh, a woman, one woman who had an abortion at 27 weeks had to travel for hours for this procedure. I think she was in Virginia and she had discovered that a fatal tumor had engulfed the fetus's brain and if it grew and the fetus grew to any greater size, delivery would not be possible. So here's, you know, if you're trying to put together in your own head, why might this happen? That it has to happen now and they can't just wait, which again is a flawed argument in and of itself because why force anybody to go through that? It's a very private, very personal decision. We don't need legislators deciding that a mother needs to carry her baby to term, give birth just to see it die. Um, but in this case, delivery would not have been possible vaginally because the tumor was growing. The tumor that was fatal and engulfing the brain was growing and so it just it wouldn't be possible to deliver it. Um, so she had to terminate the pregnancy at, uh, almost 30 weeks before that happened. Uh, another gal who was in the 20s week-wise, her doctor told her that the, the child had a fatal skeletal disorder that also prevented lung development. So if the baby was born, it would spend a few excruciating minutes struggling to breathe, failing to breathe, and then dying in pain. Um, so you can, again, maybe now is a good place to remind that, that legalizing abortion and getting rid of the barriers that uh, the Supreme Court and conservative states are putting in place does not mean that it will be unregulated. It does not mean that this will be uh, a decision forced on anybody. I, any person who's in this position and wants to carry the child to term can do that. But these are some of the reasons that women have had when they have made the choice to terminate late in the pregnancy and it's been legal and their physicians have recommended it. The last one was 32 weeks. Uh, the fetus was diagnosed with a fatal disorder that was undiagnosable earlier in the pregnancy, so couldn't do it earlier. Um, all their limbs were shriveled, they couldn't eat, swallow, or breathe, and couldn't survive, and would be great pain outside the womb, because there is a difference once you're breathing and operating on your own, you know, breathing, eating, not in the placental sac, not getting everything from mom, there is a greater risk of pain. Um, so... In this case, again, the mother had to travel to a different state. She actually had to leave New York and go to Colorado, which is such a disappointment being from New York at the moment. Um, and yeah, when those things take place, it's very rare. Um, and please don't call them partial birth abortions because that is not even kind of accurate and it is meant to sound ghoulish. So. And let's talk about before that six week mark. <laughs> as we get to the actual Texas law. So before the six week mark, 
embryos are roughly five millimeters. And I have a little picture here to illustrate that. They have an undeveloped brain, no neurological function, which is the nerve system and, and that whole thing that goes from the spine. Uh, no bones, no detectable movement. And I can share that I had an abortion at around five or six weeks. Um, here is a photo of me at that stage. Obviously not somebody who looks or honestly felt pregnant. Um, the picture of the ultrasound, you can't even see a blip of the fetus. You can only see the development of the embryonic sac. It was a really, it was surprisingly easy. Um, I can tell you anything you want to know if you have personal questions. Um, I opted for the surgical procedure because I had a friend who got, you know, heavy cramping and bleeding and whatnot with the pill experience, and I wanted to go right back to law school. My due date at the time would have been right around the bar exam, so it really would have changed the course of my life. Um, I had gone off birth control briefly because I wanted to see if there was a hormonal effect from my antidepressants and like kind of control for different variables at different times. So, you know, would I have done it differently initially? Yeah, probably if I could go back and prevent having to spend money and whatever. But the experience itself was painless, literally and uh, figuratively. I went to the Planned Parenthood in Brooklyn. They could not have been kinder. I had an abortion doula who petted my hand. Um, and yeah, so they did the, the ultrasound. I wanted to go for the surgical option. We did that. And it was the procedure itself. You're in like a twilight state, so you're not fully out. It's kind of like a laughing gas scenario. You're numbed down there. You are, your brain is out of it and but you're still like conscious you can so i semi talked through it it took about 10 minutes the actual piece that happens um and it felt a little bit like pressure because you are numbed but it feel, it's like a weird sensation it was like a, a little bit of a scraping feeling inside if you'd had a pelvic exam and you're somebody who has a vagina you know what the feeling of like weird awkward pressure is it was a little bit more than that they're done before they started. I asked to see it, but they didn't, they said they would, and then I don't know if they forgot. I was just interested in, in knowing everything, you know, not in a creepy sense, not in a celebratory, like, but I, I was interested, but they didn't follow through, whatever. Um, maybe it's a policy and they're just trying to be nice. But then they have you sit in this little ante room where they have little private areas. You have some cookie, kind of like after you get blood drawn, um, cookies and ginger ale or juice and you come down a little bit from the twilight state and then you have to have a chaperone to go home. It was about 500 bucks I want to say so not cheap but not terrible. So that was my experience and uh, for folks who would be more inclined to do the pill option that is a great option and it's something to advocate for is making those pills available over the counter and available through more venues because it's a two pill course and um, it's, it's very safe to do at home. It's uncomfortable from what I've heard because you get nausea. It's basically like a period on steroids because it's, it's forcing everything out of your uterus but there happens to be more and there's also the process of like detaching all this extra stuff. So. Um, but that is a great option, especially when you look at these places where clinics are getting fewer and farther between, and it is an option later into the first trimester. So, um, whereas these bills may eliminate that from being an option in a more, like, accountable setting, <laughs> like a clinic, maybe this is a, a good workaround is getting these by mail through a pharmacy. In any case, that's what's going on around um, six week period, common early abortion scenarios. 95% um, of women surveyed in some study that I will also link don't regret the abortion. I don't even feel, I don't like this narrative about like, oh, I'm a little sad and I cried about it, but I'll be, 
sorry, I don't mean to mock. I'm sure some people do feel that way, but I think it's, it is a narrative created to make this a decision about life. I think it kind of supports this. Everybody knows they are killing and they're all sad about it and part of them just should have stepped up and done it. I felt relief. I felt fine. I want to be a mom someday, but I will not be a good, the best parent to a child until I'm ready. And I only want a child when I can be that. So, uh, the fact that I wasn't ready at the time, now I have taken the bar and I hopefully will be better equipped to provide for a child, especially on my own. So, yeah, uh, the regret narrative, I've, I've heard some women start to come out and talk about, like, why do we say... It's really common in movies and TV shows to have that like crying moment. Um, not saying it never happens, but most women I know who have had abortions do not experience that. So, worth noting. Um, laws like the Texas one also measure the pregnancy advancement from the last period. So, when you think about the cycle, for those of you who took and or remember sex ed, um, there's the ovulation, which is what I talked about when the egg comes down and, and may or may not meet up with a sperm. There's that, and then roughly two weeks go by before your period is supposed to happen. It's like this four-week cycle in the middle of which, roughly, and people's cycles are super variant, so that's another X factor, but roughly two weeks into each cycle, you ovulate, and then two weeks after that, so at the end of the four-week cycle, your period is supposed to come. So these laws measure pregnancy from your last period, which is two weeks before you even had your egg fertilized, before the egg was even released, because it's like two weeks, egg released, fertilized, then your missed period. So it's adding two weeks on to the length of the pregnancy right off the bat, which <laughs> it's just so, it's so dishonest, it's so medically inaccurate um, that never ceases to amaze me how people get away with stuff, um, but they do. So uh, that means that the six week mark comes about four weeks after fertilization, so only about a month after you actually got pregnant, and that means roughly two weeks since your period was due. So you're talking about only two weeks for you to notice, figure out that you're pregnant, take the test, go to a clinic, schedule something, take time off for it, get to the clinic, like, that, in the best case scenario, like, if you are on it when you are a day late, two weeks is how much time you have in that scenario. Um, and people's cycles are variable. Um, I'm pretty regular, and I'm also pretty vigilant, and I was already about five or six weeks, so I was on it like that, and I already was pushing that mark. So, uh, if your cycle is irregular, or if you're, I mean, say you're moving that week, say you are going through, it's finals, like, there are some times when you're not thinking about, like, hey, when was that due? Oh, gosh, I, not everybody marks little red dots on their calendars like they do in movies. So, uh, it's, it's really right after, or even before somebody is even realizing that their period is late. Also, abortions, at least in a surgical setting, cannot be performed in the first uh, days to weeks after fertilization. Um, they definitely can't be performed before the egg attaches to the uterine wall. So this window is getting super, super narrow under a law like the Texas law when you actually can get a legal abortion. So um, just to, to think of who this is ruling out and how easily you might be ruled out for no good reason. All right, the Texas law. All right, so the Texas law. Um, I told myself that I would keep this to a minimum before I did the research, and then I actually looked at the law and I'm like, wow, there really is not much to say because there's there's just, you know, for well-drafted statutes, there's so much legalese and, and there are all these like, how do you interpret this? And then for medical-related stuff, forget it because there are so many elements that should go over our heads and involve expert input. Um, this is something that you would think would involve both of those things, even in the best case of a bad scenario, and it just 
just does it makes no sense it makes no sense it is so dumb it's really so dumb anyways so there isn't much to say about it um it criminalizes abortion after quote unquote detection of a heartbeat more on that in two seconds it penalizes anybody who aids and abets we're using our primo criminal language even though i think it's like a civil penalty for the aiding and abetting uh abortion is criminalized the aiding and abetting i guess they this is the one compromise they made is that it's a civil penalty uh for anyone who aids and abets they're civilly penalized and anybody who knowingly engages in conduct that aids and abets so this is where if you heard that heard accurately that like uber drivers or um boy i'm trying to think of other examples but anybody who knowingly engages in conduct that aids and abets in an abortion after the detection of a heartbeat is also liable now does this make a provision or can it be reasonably construed to penalize the men who conceived this pregnancy not really um because they use the language aids and abets or conduct etc etc in the abortion just knowing how the law works and how causation works um there's there's usually this like chain of conduct that you have to, the more attenuated you get from the actual criminal conduct the more difficult it is to hold somebody liable criminally or civilly which is generally a, a great thing you don't want somebody who's Imagine you trace it back to like, well, if the if the murderer's dad had never had sex with their mom, then technically this never would have happened. So let's throw grandma in jail too. Like, you gotta cut off the chain somewhere. And there are different concepts of causation. Like, this wouldn't have happened but for the conduct of this person. Like, without this person and without this conduct, this wouldn't have happened. And that's a good way of looking at it. Um, however. <laughs> You can make that argument with, with men having sex with women who then conceive and get an abortion, but the way that they phrase it as abortion, as if that's an act that solely takes place in the woman's mind and world and body, um, I just, they would have said, like, something extending it to the conception thereof like the pregnancy itself um and i'm sure men in that position would argue even if the law were written differently that like oh i didn't want her to get an abortion why don't men get to choose because it's not living in your body like a parasite whatever in any case this is a part of the conversation with with conceiving that and i don't mean to sound flip i know that um this is not an anti-men thing at all. My dad told my mom when I was conceived by accident that um, it was up to her, that it was her choice, but he's there if she was in. My parents were ready. They both wanted to do it. It was great. So this is not like an anti-man thing at all, and I, I don't say that in any holier-than-thou sense either. I, I mean it seriously. Um, but... They're, they're never part of the conversation that legislators and anti-choice men are having. Their agency in, their inextricable agency in what is happening here um, is never a part of the conversation, which is, like, can we stop pretending that this is about sex outside of marriage or, like, equal blame on both parties for life we'll get to that later i'm sorry i'm getting ahead of myself but you know there's never any mention of the other party in the two who tangoed there's no corresponding child support enforcement that is optimal in any state it like you can basically plant your seed and get out of there and never have any responsibility again is the legal reality um, so, I don't know, but people have talked about, like, oh, well, if life begins then, maybe we should make child support obligations begin then, which is a great argument if child support were enforced, um, but on the flip side and on the pro-choice side also, we don't measure anything else from conception date, um, your age is measured from your birthday, so 
the inconsistencies, it's like, I, I couldn't even sort them all out, but in any event, uh, the heartbeat myth. So what actually is being measured here is not even a heart. There is no heart. There's no heart, not even kind of a heart. What is being measured is the ultrasound picking up on Doppler radar, which is the same thing. You know when you hear a train go by and it's like, meow. Uh, the, the sound is coming at you different from different places in a relative sense to where you are and what objects the sound waves are bouncing off of. So that's what an ultrasound picks up on. The Doppler radar can pick up a flutter of electrical activity in a group of cells where a heart will be and isn't yet. So this group of cells is starting to flutter around with electricity in a way that is very similar to the sound of a heartbeat because it is setting up for this. It's not a heart yet, it's not heartbeat, but that's what we call it because it's very humanizing. Um, so that's what's being picked up, and it can be picked up very early. Again, I, I was like five, six weeks, and you could hear that. So it's about akin to those six-week markers that do it by the week mark. These laws, these emboldened laws, have been coming at us since, I think I would say since Trump took office pointedly, because before Trump there was... It was largely those like workaround laws that are meant to chill access to abortion, but things like, oh, well, you need the uh, the hallways to be 17 feet wide because what if two gurneys have to pass by? Like, you don't know, and that's what hospitals have to do. And it's just, it's making it more difficult to build and fund facilities that can provide this. Um, and they do it under the guise of women's health, but it has nothing to do with that. There's They don't even cite to evidence of that because it doesn't exist. Um, Things like any providers have to have admitting privileges at a local hospital. So now you're minimizing the number of doctors who can do it. You're minimizing the locations that providers are likely to live. It, it just like, those are the type of laws that for the last 20, 30 years before Trump were these like kind of side slings and arrows, um, jabs in the back. Now we're just straight on stabbing from the front. And that has been the case since Trump took office because everybody was so emboldened. I would say that also coincided with the emboldening of the Senate as the advise and consent body for the Supreme Court, who under the leadership of uh, Mitch McConnell refused to give Obama's last appointment, Merrick Garland, a hearing even though the constitutional procedure was otherwise followed. We kind of just, I guess, like, let that one slide. Um, that was when Neil Gorsuch was appointed, eventually, by Trump. But I think the combination of Trump coming in and both the legislative branch and thus the Supreme Court, the judiciary branch, um, just kind of being like, oh, we're, do we're doing this. Uh, because Gorsuch accepted the seat, you know, and obviously if he hadn't, somebody else would have, but um, now we're all complicit, and that's when this all really started. Um, they, yeah, they just, they just kind of hit directly at abortion now with the hopes of there being a majority big enough to do what they're doing now.